Norway Run X-Ray Yankee. Uh, good morning, Delta Lima is Yankee Bravo, Mexico. Very good morning, Roger. The name on this side is Henry, Hotel Echo, November, Romeo, Yankee. Henry is the name. My QTH in Germany, in the town of Marl, Mexico, America, Radio, London. Marl is my QTH. And my tent owner is This is a Spectrum recording I made on November 26, 2014. It's not just an audio recording, it's a recording of about 200 kilohertz of spectrum in the 10 meter band. I can play the recording, displaying the complete spectrum and waterfall, and I can then tune any station within that spectrum, or even tune multiple frequencies. 10 meters was hot that day, and Europe was booming in. This is just one example of the many unique capabilities of available in software-defined radios. By now, most hams have heard about SDRs, or software-defined radios, but it seems that many are hesitant to embrace this new technology. That's too bad, because it offers some new and exciting possibilities. If that doesn't interest you, how about better radios for less money? So, if you're a little overwhelmed with all this new stuff, I'm here to help. Together, we're going to explore this totally different way to make radios with microprocessors running software instead of things like variable frequency oscillators, mixers, detectors, filters, all that stuff we've been using for a hundred years. Making a better radio for less money is what it's all about, and for that reason, I think SDRs will soon replace the superheterodyne. While the innards have changed, SDRs are fully compatible with the aging superhet and with existing modes like AM, FM, sideband, and CW. And you can use those digital mode programs like FT8, PSK31, or Slow Scan TV, or whatever, without spending a hundred bucks or so on an interface like Signal Link. SDRs are already connected or can be connected to your computer digitally. I'm assuming you have at least the basics required for the tech exam and have a reasonable handle on kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz and recognize the various amateur bands. A lot has happened since Flex Radio introduced us to the SDR-1000 15 years ago. Hard to believe it's been that long. SDRs have improved dramatically and prices have dropped a lot. It's not just a snazzy display on your computer screen, it's the future of amateur radio, and radio in general for that matter. Understanding a little about software-defined radios will help us make a more informed buying decision. I'll try to provide a little enlightenment without getting too technical. So from time to time, I'll simply refer to some process as magic. If you wish to know more, you'll have to look elsewhere. And I encourage you to do that. These videos are just the beginning. I'll be talking about HF radios, specifically the receive function, covering 160 through 10 meters, usually providing general coverage from just a few kilohertz to 30 megahertz. Many will include 6 meters, and some will offer options for 2 meters and higher. There are some $20 dongles that offer pretty good performance for the price, but I'll be talking about higher performance radios, and mostly about the differences in receivers, even though some are transceivers. I won't be talking about specifications much either. Today's moderately priced SDRs outperform even the best radios of yesteryear. I think other differences, like features and ease of use, are more significant. A quick look at Sherwood's receiver test shows us that today's receivers, even the cheaper ones, which are pretty much SDRs, are way better than any radio made just a few years ago. Great performance just doesn't cost a bundle anymore. Even the $1,000 QRP SDR transceivers, like the ELAD FDM Duo or the Expert Sun SDR2 QRP, perform on par with the most expensive radios while sometimes offering features not even available in those expensive units. If you're more comfortable with the traditional look and feel, 
The ICOM 7300 brought us an SDR with gangbuster performance at a gangbuster price that looks and acts like a traditional superhead. To put all this in perspective, we need to talk a little about those old-fashioned superhead receivers, then introduce the basic concepts of SDRs. I'll be doing that here in part one. In part two, the hardware, we'll look at the wide variety of SDR architectures. They are not all the same. We'll compare the advantages and disadvantages of the various approaches, keeping a keen eye on cost. The requirements for front-end pre-selector filters are different for SDRs, and we'll talk about why. We'll look at some specific designs and the radios that implement them. While many see an SDR as a plain box attached to a computer, all the computing can be done in the radio, could even have knobs and buttons, and look pretty much like a traditional radio. In part three, software puts it all together, we'll look specifically at some of the differences that exist in the software from different manufacturers and how they do things differently, sometimes in very unique ways. Granted, this could be a little subjective, but my objective is to get you to think about what's important to you. SDRs offer many features not even available before, and you might find some to be really useful. The three parts should be viewed in order, as each builds on the previous information. If you feel you're getting left behind, it may be worth some reviewing. I first learned of SDRs at a presentation by Gerald Youngblood of Flex Radio at the Dayton Hamvention, probably in 2004. I was captivated by this completely different approach to building a radio, and more specifically, the receiver. My first SDR was the Flex 3000. I later built a Peaberry kit, which taught me a bit more about SDRs. I heard about direct sampling and bought a Hermes board. It was a big improvement. In 2014, I bought an ELAD FDM Duo. I became a little more aware of differences between the two. And then in 2018, I bought an inexpensive receiver, the SDR Play SDR1A, then added the direct sampling Calibri Nano and ELAD S1 receivers just to see how things are progressing. I later bought the Expert Electronics Sun SDR2 QRP transceiver. These direct samplers all have excellent performance, but they are not alike. I'll be talking mostly about the above radios and their software because I'm familiar with them. In order to understand a little about software-defined radios, we need to go back a hundred years to the early superheterodyne days. A local oscillator in the radio was mixed or heterodyned with incoming signals, creating an intermediate frequency, or IF. On AM broadcast receivers, that frequency was 455 kilohertz, and the oscillator operated 455 kilohertz above the desired frequency. So if you wanted to receive, say, 600 kilohertz, the local oscillator ran at 600 plus 455, or 1055 kilohertz. Signals from the antenna and the local oscillator were fed to a mixer stage, which created additional signals at both the sum and difference frequencies. The problem was we wanted only the difference, in this case 1055 minus 455, or 600 kilohertz. But what happens when we add 1055 to 455? Another station at 1510 kilohertz can also create a 455 kilohertz signal that passes right through the IF filters. To solve this problem, AM broadcast receivers added a tuned circuit that tracked 455 kilohertz below the oscillator. And it did a good job of rejecting that unwanted signal called an image. A two-gang variable capacitor tuned both the resonant preselector and the local oscillator. This concept did not work so well, though, when we tuned to higher frequency. Tracking the oscillator to the input tuning was difficult, and the filters were not sharp enough to fully reject the image. This led to double and triple conversion radios, and a variety of filter designs over a period of about 100 years. Many amateur radio designs of the 50s and 60s had a separately tunable preselector, 
which needed to be peaked every time the frequency was changed much. Later, preselector band pass filters for each of the amateur bands were automatically switched in when bands were changed, eliminating the extra step of tuning the preselector. Unfortunately, those mixers did some nasty things as well. In addition to creating the desired frequency and its unwanted image, additional sums and differences were created from sums and differences and sums and differences and so on. Undesired, spurious signals were created. Software designed radios, SDR for short, use digital signal processing, or DSP, to replace most of the components in a traditional superheterodyne radio. For years, our radios have used DSP to add a few features like noise reduction and automatic notch filters to the traditional superhet. Don't be confused. The ultimate SDR is all DSP. All those traditional tubes or transistors, resistors, capacitors, inductors, and more are not there anymore. And something else is not there? All those adjustments needed to align the radio. No initial alignment after manufacturing, and no alignment ever needed to correct for aging of components. The basic concept of an SDR receiver is pretty simple. Convert incoming radio frequency signals to data. Manipulate the data with very complex arithmetic beyond the understanding of us mere mortals. In other words, magic. Then convert the data to sound to feed our speakers or headphones. The great thing, they can do all this with such perfection that those spurious signals can be practically eliminated. Let's take a look at the early SDR days of amateur radio when Flex Radio introduced the SDR 1000 around 2003. Understanding what they did back then will help us understand what's happened since then. So, specifically, what did Flex do? Well, first, they combined some tried and true concepts to achieve some pretty remarkable things. A process called direct conversion, not to be confused with direct sampling, had been used in the early CW days. A local oscillator was mixed with the incoming RF to directly create an audio tone when the carrier was present. Notice, there is no IF. The only image would be another nearby CW station producing a different audio tone. Careful tuning would change the pitch of each signal to allow easier CW copying. Since this eliminated the IF, there was no need for preselector filters to get rid of RF images. There are no RF images. Flex combined direct conversion with a phasing technique that was used in the 1950s for eliminating the upper and lower sidebands when creating a single sideband signal for transmission. Several amateur radio products using this method were introduced in the 1950s by Central Electronics. The Heathkit SB10, SSB Exciter, did that as well. Let's see how all these concepts might work in a modern SDR receiver. As an example, we could inject an oscillator into the incoming RF from the antenna, maybe with some preamplification, say at 14.2 megahertz for 20 meters. This is all old-fashioned analog, no digital yet. Let's imagine the strong injected oscillator is the carrier of an AM signal. Then let's imagine that all those signals above and below the so-called carrier are the upper and lower sidebands, very wide sidebands, 100 kilohertz or more. Since the signals above the 14.2 megahertz carrier are different from the signals below the 14.2 megahertz carrier, the upper sideband is different from the lower sideband. We then detect this sort of AM signal. This gives us a very wide audio signal, around 100 kilohertz in our example. But now we have kind of a mess. All the signals above 14.2 megahertz are commingled with all the signals below 14.2. But we can do something to get them apart again. How? 
We'll need to once again do exactly what we just did, with one exception. We'll shift the injected 14.2 megahertz by 90 degrees. It's exactly the same frequency, but shifted by 90 degrees. The original signal we'll call I for in phase, and we'll call the second signal Q for quadrature, as 90 degrees is one-fourth of a complete 360-degree cycle. Quad, like four, okay? Now, both I and Q are a mess because the upper and lower sidebands are commingled. But rest easy, the magic is waiting. We can then combine these two signals and, like magic, separate those signals above 14.2 megahertz from those below 14.2 megahertz and get rid of the carrier we introduced as well. We now can tune to any signal within that spectrum as well as create a spectrum and waterfall display, sometimes called a pan adapter. Notice that the data in I and Q, and hence the separated sidebands, contain everything necessary to receive any signal within that spectrum, in addition to creating the spectrum waterfall. That highly detailed spectrum shows what's happening now, and the waterfall shows what has happened. It's that beautiful spectrum waterfall that first attracted me to SDRs. I said I wouldn't talk much about math, but you might encounter a term FFT in SDR discussions. FFT stands for Fast Fourier Transform, and that's the math that creates that beautiful spectrum waterfall display. The FFT was named for Joseph Fourier, a French mathematician who lived 200 years ago. The concept seemed so unusual that it was kind of ridiculed for a while. There wasn't even electricity back then, so it's a little surprising that today the FFT finds purpose not only in the spectrum display, but the ubiquitous MPEG and JPEG compression for video, sound, and pictures, and of course much more. In the early flex designs, most of the process I just discussed was performed in the analog domain. The processing necessary to create I and Q signals was analog, and then the I and Q, which are kind of wideband audio signals, remember, were fed to the stereo sound card input of your PC. The I and Q signals were then digitized as left and right stereo audio signals, and your PC did the rest. Typical sound card sampling frequencies were 48 kilohertz, 96 kilohertz, or 192 kilohertz. Later, digitizing took place in the radio, but the use of sound card frequencies continued. This digitizing process is known as analog to digital or A to D conversion. Just to make sure we don't leave anyone behind, let's take a quick look at the uh, process of digitizing a signal. It means taking a sample of a waveform periodically and creating numbers to represent that sample. The more data bits we use to represent each sample and how often we take each sample determines how well the original signal is represented by the data. In the early digital days, an engineer named Harry Nyquist enlightened us with a bit of wisdom. He said that our sample frequency must be at least twice the highest frequency that we wish to digitize. In other words, the bandwidth of spectrum to be digitized must be less than half the sampling frequency. Thus, the so-called Nyquist frequency is half the sampling frequency. Flex limited the sampling frequency to a maximum of 192 kilohertz, thus digitizing a maximum of 96 kilohertz in I and 96 kilohertz in Q. Combining I and Q then separated the signals that were in the 96 kilohertz spectrum above our 14.2 megahertz hypothetical carrier from those in the 96 kilohertz spectrum below 14.2 megahertz. In the real world, you get a little less than the Nyquist frequencies, so in this case, we get a little less than 96 plus 96, or 192 kilohertz of spectrum. Remember, this wide audio contains all the information necessary to create a spectrum and waterfall display as well as to listen to any signals within that spectrum. Multiple signals may be tuned in at the same time, in effect giving us multiple receivers. 
As an example, the original FlexPower SDR software allowed us to tune two frequencies at once, but they must both be within the spectrum range. While this is the most common approach, it's not the only method. We'll discuss that more in parts two and three. Things stayed this way until the Dayton Hamvention in 2012, when Flex introduced their new 6000 series, which they touted as a game changer. And the improvement in performance was indeed a game changer. They brought direct sampling to the amateur, sampling at frequencies of many megahertz instead of a couple hundred kilohertz. Previously, the high-speed A to D converters were way too expensive, and not to mention the cost of high-speed processing needed to handle all that extra data. That processing is typically handled in the radio with an FPGA, or Field Programmable Gate Array. High-speed A to D converter and FPGA prices started dropping around 2012, and the direct sampling SDR became affordable at least to the ham with $4,000 or so sitting around. About the same time, another group, HP SDR, High Performance Software Defined Radio, introduced a completely open source direct sampling transceiver using the open source software Power SDR already being used by Flex Radio in their earlier designs. The HP SDR designs evolved into the Hermes board, which is later manufactured by Apache Labs in India launching their ANAN series of SDRs. Thankfully, prices have continued to drop, and direct sampling is the norm for all but the least expensive receivers. If you're spending over $200 or so for a receiver today, it should be direct sampling. So what's so different about the direct sampling receiver? In one sense, not as much as you may think. We end up doing about the same thing as the direct conversion receiver, except we digitize the RF coming right off the antenna. The down conversion is not accomplished with a variable frequency oscillator like the 14.2 megahertz in my previous example. It now is all mathematics. For that reason, it's sometimes called digital down conversion, or DDC. In a transceiver, the transmitted signal may use digital up conversion, or DUC, and the whole process labeled DDC, DUC. Using digital down conversion, fewer spurious signals are created, and more importantly, we can now create I and Q signals digitally. Remember before, we directly converted the RF to I and Q in the analog domain, and then used the computer's sound card to digitize I and Q. We then processed I and Q digitally in the computer, but we created them as analog signals. In order to completely separate the frequencies above our 14.2 megahertz example from those below that frequency, I and Q must be exactly the same amplitude and exactly 90 degrees apart. The analog creation of I and Q was unstable and left us with errors that could not be fully corrected. Those errors created a digital image from the unwanted sideband. The math gives us perfection that does not drift or change with age. I said earlier that this I and Q technique eliminated the need for a front-end filter to reject those unwanted images created in the superhead. That's true, but now we have another problem. Remember the Nyquist frequency I mentioned earlier, one-half the sampling frequency? It turns out that if we allow any frequencies above the Nyquist frequency into our analog-to-digital converter, it mistakes them for lower frequencies. You can't have that. This is known as aliasing. A certain frequency is aliased to a lower frequency. We must eliminate those signals above the Nyquist frequency with a low-pass filter, it has to be an analog filter before the analog to digital conversion. That filter is called, not surprisingly, an anti-aliasing filter. Now, what I have just said is true, but it's not the whole story. It sounds crazy, but we can actually digitize those signals above the Nyquist frequency. In fact, we can digitize signals above the sampling frequency. So Harry Nyquist was not completely correct. Look at it this way. 
Imagine some fan fold paper like we used in the old dot matrix printers. Then we'll call this first page Nyquist zone one from zero to one half the sampling frequency or Nyquist frequency, the only zone relevant for Mr. Nyquist's wisdom. Zone two goes from one half the sampling frequency to the sampling frequency. Zone three goes from the sampling frequency to one and a half times the sampling frequency. Zone four from one and a half to two times the sampling frequency. And this pattern continues in multiples of the Nyquist frequency. With no filtering before the A to D converter, all the signals in all these Nyquist zones will be digitized and will be alias to frequencies below the Nyquist frequency. They can no longer be separated from each other or the frequencies we want. So what can we do? Simply put a bandpass filter for each zone we want in front of the A to D converter. Of course, we only need a low-pass filter for zone 1. All these are called anti-aliasing filters. This can lead to some confusing terminology. Generally, if nothing is mentioned, you may uh, assume that only signals below the Nyquist frequency, that is zone 1, are digitized. This might also be called sub-Nyquist. All the higher zones might be referred to as super-Nyquist, or simply undersampled. Just to add to the confusion, another similar term, oversampling, has nothing to do with this previous discussion. Oversampling refers to the idea of sampling way beyond our needs. This might seem to be a waste, but the madness has a purpose. The data representing the higher unneeded frequency spectrum can be exchanged for a higher bit depth of the spectrum we are using. Another example of math magic. This process is called decimation. I think a poorly chosen word which brings to mind something completely different. Hopefully by now you have a pretty good idea of how things can be done. Along with adding a few words to your vocabulary, we learned about front end filters, I and Q, A to D conversion, DSP, the Nyquist frequency undersampling, oversampling, direct sampling, aliasing, decimation, FPGAs, and a bit more. Understanding these concepts and the related terminology will help us understand the different SDR architectures. We'll talk about that in part two, the hardware.